How did we get here? We know things are not the way they are supposed to be. We see pain and brokenness. We experience war and turmoil. The weak are taken advantage of. The oppressed are pressed down further. There is a curse on this place, and somehow we know it. In the midst of darkness and conflict, the psalmist rejoices. God has provided for him his law. God has spoken to him his word. God has given him light. Good morning. The last two stanzas in Psalm 119, that's where we're at today. This has been a, a really fun ride of walking through Psalm 119. I hope that you've learned things in the process of this. I hope that it's helped to bring this out. As, as Andy was saying, I hope that it's become one of your favorite psalms and something that you're going to want to go back to and you're going to re- want to be reminded of some of the things that we've talked about You see, the psalmist writes from this personal emotion, and and I love that as we've walked through this, we've recognized what that emotion is about, that it's about who he is and him recognizing who God is, and then him writing about the word that God has given to him. And it doesn't just stop with, I have the word, and that's the end of it, but what it is is more that he takes this knowledge that God has given him of himself, and he started to apply it to his life. And this should urge us as the readers to do the same. And so Paul Tripp says this about the Psalms, and I wanted to share this quote with you as I came across it this week. He says, you and I were not hardwired to make our way through this fallen world on our own. We were meant to exist with eyes filled with the beauty of God's presence and hearts at rest in the lap of his goodness. This is what I love about the Psalms. They put difficulty and hope together in the tension of hardship and grace that is the life of everyone this side of eternity. It is not hard to recognize the environment of the Psalms. The Psalms live in your city, on your street, in your family. The Psalms tell your story. It's a story of hope and disappointment, of need and provision, of fear and mystery, of struggle and rest, and of God's boundless love and amazing grace. People in the Psalms get angry, grow afraid, cry out in confusion, survive opposition, hope for better days, hurt for one another, run from God, trust in God, make foolish choices, ask for forgiveness, and grow wiser and stronger. They are people just like you and me. And that's what we feel when we go through the Psalms. I don't, at least that's what I feel. As I read it, I go, It's so nice to know that people living thousands and thousands of years ago have the same problems that I do, that they struggle with the same things, that they wake up and they go, God, what's going on? God, I trust in you. I know you've got it, but what's going on? And to cry out to him and to to just go after his heart and to try to figure out what's going on. And I love that about the Psalms. And so when I think about even what we've learned walking through Psalm 119, I tried to pick out some of my favorites. We learn that we're sojourners in this broken world, which is permeated by sin. That God often leads his people to places of desperation to work his ways into our lives. We've learned that we're called to share the message with all of him, of his saving and steadfast love. We are to pursue joy where it can be truly found, in Jesus alone. We learn that we're called to live in authentic community with others. That we're not autonomous, that we're not self-sufficient, but God is the owner of everything and he's in charge. We've learned that our questions should drive us to God and that we're going to have questions, that it's okay to have questions, but let them drive us to God. And we know this is one that has come up time and time again. People have quoted the three points from this message many times. We know that God knows, that God cares, and that God acts. All of these points, all of this psalm, All of scripture should give us peace in our hearts, should should help us to go, he's in control. He's got it. He's already taken care of it in his son, Jesus Christ. 
And so as we've seen through the journey through Psalms and as we see today in the very first verse that we're going to read, the second to last stanza, and then we'll read the last stanza, the psalmist stands in the awe of the word of God. He recognizes the power it has in his life. He recognizes that God's word is the hope to the world. And this is a guy who's writing this far before Christ came. But God gave him vision. God allowed him to know that Messiah was coming. God allowed him to see where he should put his trust, where he should rest and find peace. And so he sees ahead. He may not know all the details, but we know, as we hold God's word in our hand, we know that God does this great work through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so as we come to read this together, my prayer is that God would continue one last time in Psalm 119, and then as you go on and read it on your own time and time again over the course of your life, that God would use it to change us, to transform us, to work in us, and to begin to continue to work in us in that process. So please stand with me for the reading of God's word. Psalm 119, we're going to start in verse 161. We are going to read through 176. 161. Princes persecute me without cause, but my heart stands in awe of your words. I rejoice at your word like one who finds great spoil. I hate and abhor falsehood, but I love your law. Seven times a day I praise you for your righteous rules. Great peace have those who love your law. Nothing can make them stumble. I hope for your salvation, O Lord, and I do your commandments. My soul keeps your testimonies. I love them exceedingly. I keep your precepts and testimonies, for all my ways are before you. And then the last stanza, and this is the one we're going to concentrate on today. Let my cry come before you, O Lord. Give me understanding according to your word. Let my plea come before you. Deliver me according to your word. My lips will pour forth praise, for you teach me your statutes. My tongue will sing of your word, for all your commandments are right. Let your hand be ready to help me, for I have chosen your precepts. I long for your salvation, O Lord, and your law is my delight. Let my soul live and praise you, and let your rules help me. I have gone astray like a lost sheep. Seek your servant, for I do not forget your commandments. May God bless the reading of his word. Let's pray. So, Father God, we ask right now that your word would be applied to our hearts and to our lives. That as we walk through this last stanza in Psalm 119, as we're reminded of things that you've said and, and the way that you've spoken through this psalmist over the course of this entire psalm, that you would take it and that you would pry our hearts open and that you would shine light into areas that we have tried to hide, that we have tried to hold on to, and that you would convict us of that sin and help us to come to you, to repent and to give it to you, and to grow closer to you in that process, God. So work in us, we pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. So we're in this last stanza, the longest chapter in the Bible. What I love about the longest chapter in the Bible is it's about the Bible. Doesn't that make sense? the longest chapter in the Bible, and it's about the Bible. And so we have this long prayer about God's word, and the psalmist showing us how it points him to God's salvation. And yet, as we've read through this, if you listened to this last stanza, you would have heard that there's a different tone. There's a different tone in this last stanza than what he's been saying. It becomes very personal, very authentic, and he, when we think of this psalm, this was a congregational psalm written to praise God together as a congregation, and they would recite it together. But you get to this last piece, and it's almost like the psalmist said, man, I got to get mine in. Like, I got to share what I need to what, share with God, and so I'm going to place it right here. And here's what he's doing. He's showing us. This is what happens when you spend time in God's word. We've been reading this psalm, and it's all about God's word. And years ago, I went, a couple years ago, I should say, I went through Psalm 119, and I did a study on it where I underlined every time that it said testimony, precepts, word, promise, commandments, in every single line. You know, there's, it's two sentences, or it's one sentence, two lines. Every single line, I have an underline. 
And as I go through it, I see all these underlines. All about God's word. But God's word does one thing. It points us to Jesus. Everything in this Bible points us to what God is doing in this earth. And that points us to Jesus. And so this psalmist is showing us that it happens when we spend time in God's word, when we take time and effort to let it affect our lives. And that's what we're going to look at today. Are there these characteristics in this last stanza that I want us to look at and make sure that we understand what happens when we spend time in God's word. And so this first couple stanzas we see, 169 and 170, we read these stanzas and we realize that it's prayer. One of the things that we think of, one of the things that we know is that when we spend time in, God, in God's word, it drives us to prayer. Now my question to you is, what do you think of when I say the word prayer? Talking to God? Communing with God? Coming into God's presence? Having fellowship with God? For many, they hear the word prayer and they, they have a specific picture that comes to mind. It could be people in a group with closed eyes voicing words to God, to a higher power. Some people, they think about people bowed down in a certain direction. Someone getting themselves quiet and opening up their mind. Might be a specific place people think of. Maybe going to a church or a, a temple, a spot in nature, somewhere where they connect with God. People since the beginning of time have prayed, have looked to find connection with God. Now, I'm not saying that they have all done a great job at that. In fact, I would say that over probably the span of it, ever since the earth was created and ever since man has walked this earth, many people have messed it up. Many people have decided to do it their own way and not to submit to the way God calls them to prayer. And then we come to this stanza and we see that the psalmist gives us this, this perspective of what prayer can be. And so the beauty of it is he shows us a couple of real ways that we can pray to God. And he uses two specific words here to represent prayer. The first one is, let my cry. He talks about crying out to God. And then the second piece is, let my plea. He talks about pleading with God. He uses cry as this emphatic word to describe his requests. And he uses plea as a humble designation of his standing before God. So there's this very deep personal nature in prayer. This very deep personal nature as they, they come to God. And, and yet, if you notice, he says more. He says, let my cry come before you. Let my plea come before you. These are not words that a normal Hebrew would use. And here's the reason why. The Hebrews understood who God was. That God was holy that God was perfect. And they also understood who they were, that they were not holy, that they were not perfect. And so a lot of times they would pray to God, but they wouldn't say, let, them come be let me come before you, let me bring my cry, my plea before you. Instead they would say, God, please take care of this. I know who you are and I can't be anywhere near you. I can't be in your presence. I can't come that close to you because I am sinful. And it's a good reminder for us. It's a good moment for us to reflect of who we are and recognize that we are sinful, every single one of us. I know some of you think that you might be really good, and yet you're still sinful. Because scripture makes it very clear that we are all born of sin, that we have all fallen short of the glory of God. And because of that, we can't just stand in his presence I'll tell you today that kids are not born good. Anybody who's worked in the nursery knows that at times. <laughs> but understand, it isn't their brothers and their sisters that corrupt them. It isn't going to school that corrupts them. It is because from, from the moment that Adam and Eve decided to trust in themselves and make a decision that they thought was best instead of trusting in what God said, Sin has permeated this world. This world is a broken world. And so when you hold that little baby as beautiful and as sweet as that little baby, it, it is a bundle of sin. And it's okay. Because just like us, we pray 
And we work hard that they grow up and they know who Jesus is and they put their faith and their trust in Jesus Christ and what he's done. And it's the same with this psalmist. He comes before God and he goes, let this prayer come before you. It's a bold move. And it's a bold move he can only do because he has put his trust in future salvation for the coming Messiah that God has shown him. Paul writes in Ephesians that we only have access to the Father through Christ. It's the same reason we pray. At the, end, at the end of every time we pray, we say these words. We pray in the name of Jesus. We pray in Jesus' name. There's a reason we do that because that is the, the way that we have access to the Father. It is because what Christ has done. And so when we pray, we know that we're coming through Christ to the Father. It's the only way to pray. And so this psalmist, the psalmist who has celebrated God's word to him, recognized that God has spoken to us through his word and that God asks us to speak back to him. And so he does. He expresses his cry. His, he's pleading with God. He knows that it's not enough just for him to pray, though. If you continue on in both of these verses, he says, give me understand, understanding according to your word. Deliver me, he says, but how? According to your word. He is asking that his requests are shaped according to God's word. We should do the same in our lives. Our most basic requests should be asking God to give us an understanding of his word. We need to know the word of God to know him. He's given us revelation of who he is, and we hold it in our hands. Constantly we have access to it like no other generation has ever before. We have it in multiple different kinds of ways, on our phone, on our iPad, on our, in, in book form. We have it everywhere that we want to. There are people living in this earth who struggle to have even access to Scripture. If you've ever watched, there are videos of people in, in places like China who just get pieces of the Bible, like somebody just came and tore out pages, and they're handing them out to them, and they're celebrating, and they're crying and we have Bibles and Bibles that probably sit in our homes that we hardly ever pick up. We have access to the Bible all over the internet, and we hardly ever go there when we get on the internet. But instead, we go to news sources and Facebook and ESPN, and I'll just, I'll let all my stuff hang out. That's fine. Right? And yet, we hold God's word, the revelation of Himself. And these scriptures show us who God is. They show us what he would say. Half the time we're going, God, what do you want me to do? And he's going, hello? I'm not going to tell you anything that's going to contradict what you already have. So get to know me. Get to know my heart. Get to know what this means. And if we don't listen to God by being in his word, what is forming our prayers? What is causing us to pray the way that we pray? Our circumstances? Our friends? Our conversations? Our desires? Well, we've already talked about our desires, right? Our desires are sinful. We need God's desires in our heart. And then I would also ask if we're only ever talking with God and never listening to God. What kind of relationship is that? What kind of relationship is it if we only ever talk to him and we never listen? What kind of marriage would that be if you only ever talked to your wife but you never listened? Or vice versa? Your heavenly father wants a full relationship with you, a two-way relationship and a large part of that relationship comes through his word. And spending time in God's word is the best way to inform your prayer life and to cause your prayers to align with God's heart. I encourage you to read scripture. I know a lot of people after last week and when we talked about preaching the gospel to yourself daily, we talked about getting in his word. And I know groups of people that have already, they've, they've talked to our staff and told us, hey, we're getting together and we're going through a reading plan together and we're discussing it and I think that is wonderful. 
That is a wonderful, wonderful thing. And I would even say, take it one step farther. And those, those words that you are reading, don't just let them become words you are reading, but let them settle on your heart. Pray them into your life. Let them change the way that you pray. I would pray today that as we walk through this last psalm, that we would, that we would sit on this and we would go, God, work this in us. Help us to pray this way. Help us to have these kind of pieces in our life. But there's another outcome of spending time in God's word, and it changes our desires, the motivations of our heart. The psalmist here sees that, that very same outcome. He cries out and he pleads with God, but it doesn't end there. Instead, according to your word, he says, and then he changes he changes to praise in verse 171 and 172. He says, my lips will pour forth praise. My tongue will sing of your word. And so as he's praying and he's pleading out and he's crying out to God, he thinks about how big God is, how great God is. And what does it do? It causes him to praise God. It causes him to sing about who God is. Why? Why? Because as we learned, as we walked through the psalm, God is good, and he does good. How can we not sing praise to him? That's the beauty of God's word. As it sticks in your mind, and as you continue to let it float through your mind over the course of the day and the week, it naturally gives rise to praise. Our praise, our song, should be centered on God's word. It's one of the things that we are very in tune with and we try to make a very big point of is that every song we sing is based on scripture, that it has scripture intertwined in it. Why? Because songs are catchy. And come Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday and your week gets a little dull and it gets a little mundane, but you have a song popped into your head, we're hoping that it's a song that has scripture intertwined in it. We're hoping that it's a song that causes you to think about his word, to think about Christ and his death and his life and his resurrection and what it means in your life and the way that he's empowering you. And, and even that first song we sang coming right out of Psalm 150 and to think about just the ways that we're supposed to praise him and the ways that we're supposed to work. I would encourage you to make sure that your thoughts that the songs that are in your head, that they're anchored in scripture, that they're proclaiming who God is and what he's done, and that they cause you to think about his word. His word is a great gift to us. John, in John 17, Jesus, at the, at the end of his time on earth, he's praying this priestly prayer, and he says these words. He's talking to the Father, and he says, sanctify them in truth. And then he says, your word is truth. You want to be sanctified in your life? Be in his word. Let his word change your life. When we spend time in his word and our mind is always thinking about it, it causes us to praise him. Matthew Henry, great theologian, says this. He says, when God gives understanding, he opens the heart and then the lips. So I'd ask you this, what are the things that are in your mind each week? What are the things that you get excited to share about? I'm not saying that you should only walk around quoting scripture because people are going to think you're weird, right? I mean, if you're going to talk to me, there's other things I love. I love to talk about my family. I love to talk about my wife and my girls. They don't really like me talking about them publicly into a microphone, but I like to talk about them. If you were here at Trunk or Treat last night, and you know every year I decorate my car the same way, I, I like to talk about my Minnesota Vikings. And this is a year I actually get excited to talk about them because they finally have a decent team. <laughs> I like to talk about soccer. I have a team called Tottenham Hotspur that I follow out of England. Those are things I love to talk about. I love to talk about what I call lyrical theology, which is putting scripture into rhyming words that is with hip-hop. It's called rap. I understand not everybody would like it, and, and the stuff I listen to is deeply scriptural, but I know it's not for everybody, and that's okay, but it's stuff I like to talk about. We have a, a guy in my VIA community, he's like, okay, that's one kind of music I really don't like, but if you send me some of your songs, I'd love to just try to listen to them. Well, I send him this long email with links and like explaining each song and where the guy comes from and what he's rapping about, and he only listened to one. <laughs> 
And he said, I'm more of a country guy. And I'm like, well, then this is opposite of what you're used to listening to. And that's okay. But for each of us, we have stuff we love to talk about. My hope would be that in the midst of that, that also scripture would be a part of my everyday vernacular. It doesn't mean that I have to quote it with reference points, but what it means that it's so much a part of my life that I just see God in the way that he's working and the way that he's speaking and everything. Now, my daughters, and, and my wife hasn't said so much, but she probably feels the same way, probably hate that a little bit about me because there's times we pause music or we pause a movie so I can share what God is doing in the midst of that moment. They're like, seriously, you're ruining the movie, Dad. But there's this God moment where God's working or the redeeming story is coming out. And yeah, I know it's just a Disney movie, but it's there. God uses everything around us to remind us, instruct us, grow us, and to show us himself. But if your mind isn't meditating on his word, you're going to have a hard time seeing it. So I would encourage you to be in his word because all of our lives should be praise unto Jesus. Not just when we come here to church, but in our workplace, in our homes, in our neighborhoods, everything. And so the more we get to know him, the more that we will see him. And the more clearly we understand the brokenness of this world through the light of scripture, the more rightly we feel longing. And that's the next three verses, 173 to 175. Is the psalmist praises God and at the same time speaks of his longing for God to save him. If you remember back to verse 19, which is a long time ago in our sermon series, we saw the psalmist call himself a sojourner, which means he isn't at home on this earth, that he is traveling through, that this is not his home. But then he continues to write about God's word and he gets to verse 175 and he asks for continued life in order to praise God. So here's here's the psalmist who goes to this moment of feeling sick of the problems and the brokenness of this world and so he's homesick for God's perfect restoration of the world. And he becomes this understanding that God wants to use him and God wants to proclaim his glory through him. And he says, give me continued life to praise you because that is what my life is for. But in the midst of that, there's this longing. There's this this longing of the brokenness that we live in and what can we do about it? And there are things that we can do about it at times, but then there's other times where you just have to look at it and go, only God can fix it. I, I just have to let him have it, and I just have to lay it at his feet. And so I would ask you, what things are you longing for? For some of us, for some of us it might be stuff that we think, I'm longing for this because I think it's going to solve my problems. It could be a, a job or a car, or maybe it's a house, maybe it's material possessions. For others of us, it's emotional or relational. Maybe it's loss. Maybe it's grief. Maybe it's our marriage. Maybe it's our children, our adult children, and where they're at in their life. Or maybe maybe it's our young children and just the way that they're acting at the moment. Maybe it's addiction, confusion, confusion. Whatever you are longing for, I want to tell you that it's okay. It is okay to long for better things, better days, but not because you want things to fill your void in your life, but because you see the brokenness of this world and you go, God, please help this world. I'm not telling you to long for material possessions in a house because it's not going to solve anything in your life, correct? But I'm telling you, if you look at that and you go, something's broken, that people need this, that I need this, God, help me. Cry out. Plead out to him and say, God, I need to live according to your word. What does that mean? God, my heart breaks. My heart hurts. God, why can't my kids live for you? What do I need to do to see my children and my grandchildren live for you? God, why can't I find the job that I really feel like I need that will use my strengths? God, help this broken world. 
God, why, why does my nation look and feel the way that it does and it's, it's so divided? God, would you just fix this broken world? It is okay as a Christ follower to praise him in one breath and long for his glory to be on this earth. But don't let it drive you to sin. Don't let it drive you to selfishness, but instead let it drive you to Jesus. That you would do this in such a way that your heart would become his heart. That you would see, your eyes would see what he sees. That instead of seeing someone stuck in addiction and making bad choices, that you would see the brokenness that they are living in and God would give you the strength to offer Christ in the midst of that moment. That God would give you the opportunity to walk with them, to walk side by side with them through the tough parts of their life. That might be you today. You might be longing, longing for something more, longing for something different. It's okay. Keep longing. Give those longings to God. He says, I long for your salvation. Let your hand be ready to help me. Let my soul live and praise you. This dissatisfaction with our current state should drive us to expectation of what God will do. And then it gets this, this last verse where he says, I have gone astray like a lost sheep. Seek your servant, for I do not forget your commandments. This constant diet and meditation on his word drove him to prayer. It drove him to praise. It drives him to longing. And then he ends with this very personal, God, I'm gonna, I, I feel this tendency to stray. I feel this tendency to walk away from you. I feel this tendency to live my selfish ways. But he doesn't stop there. He says, seek your servant. The effect of study and meditation on God's word brings greater clarity to who we are and who God is and that we need him to seek us. He begins to see things more accurately, to see his actions, his thoughts, his motivations fall completely short and he confesses this sin to God. He presents this to God and says, God, help me. So let's say that I'm standing in my backyard and we're, we're eating together. The sun's going down. It's a beautiful night, right? The sun is just almost on the way down, so it's slightly dark. By the way, this wouldn't happen in the Hintz household because we don't eat outside. We don't like the outdoors. It's, just, it's full of bugs and that's just who we are. But let's say we're doing this for the sake of my illustration. I could have a stain of barbecue on my shirt, but I wouldn't see it. Why? Because it's dark. Because it's twilight. Because it would be hard to see. But let's say we come inside the house, and now I'm into brighter lights. That brighter light shows that stain on my shirt very clearly. I go from not knowing about it, not caring, to being embarrassed that I've got a stain of barbecue on my shirt. This is what God's word does to us. That as we spend time in God's word, the Holy Spirit illuminates it to our heart and we see the stains of sin on our lives. Not so we can just say, yeah, I'm dirty, get over it. But instead so we can say, I can only be clean by the righteousness of Christ, by his life, death, and resurrection. And so God, apply that to my life today. This is the way the psalmist ends, Psalm 119, this entire long psalm. And he comes to this very last verse and he goes, I stray, I sin, but seek me, God. Come after me, show me my sin. For I do not forget your commandments. The psalmist sees this so clearly and makes this humble confession so great Because there's this humility that runs inside of him. This humility of this recognition of who he knows God is and who he knows he is to be. And I love that he repents of his sin, of strength from God at the very end of this psalm. And I pray that we would be repenting sinners the same way, boldly putting our life 
and our eternity of who Christ is into Christ. That we would rest in that. That we would live out our lives for Christ. That we would love others because he first loved us. That that would be where it comes from. We know we can trust God. We know that we can put our life in him because he is faithful. And we know that we can come with expectation that he will forgive our sins because his word says that he will. In 1 John 1, 9, it says, If you confess your sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. And so even as we end the service today, we're going to end with communion because it is the perfect moment to practice some of what we just spoke about. Because Paul writes in, in 1 Corinthians that you don't come to communion and you just grab a cup and you grab a piece of bread. But you remember what Christ did for you. And you examine your heart and you confess your sin. This is what Christ followers are made of. This is what we should be about. That we should be the first to repent and confess. That we shouldn't be the last one to hold on and go, no, nope, I'm right, I'm right. But instead, we should be the first one to go, I'm wrong. I made that mistake. I'm the one who did that. God, please forgive me. Whoever I offended, would you please forgive me? And so today, as we close the service, the worship team's going to come. And we're going to make some space for communion. And I'm going to ask you to come forward and take a cup, take a piece of bread, and find a place in this room. It could be right back at your seat. It could be anywhere else that you want. And spend some time talking to God. If you need to cry out and plead with him, I encourage you to do that. If you just want to spend some time praising God for what he's done through his son's body and blood, absolutely do that. If you need to spend some time confessing your sin, that would be a great moment to do that as well. If you want to spend some time longing and, and, and talking to God about the brokenness of this world and giving it to him, go for that too. Whatever it might be, I pray that we would do that. So my, my prayer is that we would hunger for his word. That as we read his word, that we would ask the Holy Spirit to illuminate it to our hearts. That we would find a better rhythm in our lives of being in his word for his sake, so that his name would be made great in our lives, and for our sake, so that we would be used by him. That it would drive us deeper to prayer. So even before you come forward for communion, I'd like to pray. So Father God, I pray right now for every heart in this room. I ask that you would work in them. God, I pray for those of us who know you, that you would draw us closer to you that, you would, that you would draw us into a discipline of spending time in your word so that your Holy Spirit can work in us and change us and transform us through your word. Sanctify us, God, through your word, we pray. God, I pray that we would be very real and authentic to you, that our emotions, we wouldn't hide them from you but we would share them with you and that it would draw us closer to you. God, I pray for those in this room who don't know you, who have not put their faith and their trust in you and your salvation. I ask right now that as they've heard the gospel being preached and they've heard about Jesus' life, death, and resurrection and how his righteousness is what allows us to be clean, that your Holy Spirit would even straight, right now start working that in their heads. That they would start to understand who you are and that they would confess their sin. That they would say, I am a sinner, God, and I need you. You are the only way that I can be clean of sin. And God, that when they do that, that you would draw them to you and that you would adopt them and call them sons and daughters, just like you have so many in this room. If that's you today, do exactly what I just said and cry out to him, plead with him. Say, I am a sinner who needs a Savior, and only Christ can offer you that. And so, God, as we come in just a moment, we thank you for your body that was broken for us, that was bruised, that was beat, that was torn. 
that was mistreated that would become a sacrifice for our sin. And we thank you for your blood that was spilled for us, that, that would cleanse us, that your word says would wash us whiter than snow. So God, in just a moment, when we hold that piece of bread and we hold that cup in our hands, we remember what you have done for us. We celebrate the life that we have found in you. And we thank you for a future life, eternity with you, where the brokenness and the, and the sin that permeates this world will be no more. So God, we praise you and we thank you for this. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. I'd ask you during this song to make your way forward, if you would.